Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Rosie Rios, former Treasurer of the United States and the founder of Empowerment 2020. So today is Equality Day. It is uh, the commemoration of the suffrage movement, the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. Uh, but we have a long way to go before we are equal. And this is really just the beginning of a much bigger conversation. And so for all of you to be here, it's interesting, someone actually asked me when we were planning this event, a, a, a speaker had asked me, would you mind changing the date because it's really going to be tough on a Saturday. And I said to him, I said, with all due respect, we didn't pick August 26th, August 26th picked us. So the fact that you are all here on, on a Saturday uh, to spend your day with us, to be inspired, uh, means everything. And um, it is a very interesting day here in San Francisco. You may notice some unanticipated activity, and uh, our numbers are not going to be our numbers in person, but our numbers out there are very, very fierce. So. <laughs> So hopefully the Empowerment 2020 movement will make a difference in what we see and how decisions are made, not just for us today, but for our future leadership. And hopefully you will get a chance to meet all the people who came together to, to make all of this happen. This is a very, very unique agenda. I just want to explain to you very, very quickly exactly what is Empowerment 2020. So Empowerment 2020 is basically three areas. It's writing history, R-I-G-H-T, which is the physical recognition of historic American women. It's women, money, and power. So instead of sex, money, and power, it's women, money, and power. And it's, <laughs> yes. It's putting women in positions of money and power. Women in the C-suite, women in corporate boards, women in elected office. And the third part of Empowerment 2020 are these count-up conferences. This is the second count-up conference. Our first one was the 100 that we launched at Harvard last year. This is the 1,000. And then, of course, it's going to grow from there. And the purpose of this conference is really to focus on those first two areas of writing history and women, money, and power in terms of actionable items. What are we delivering? What are our goals? What are we working backwards from, from 2020? Because we have three years to show what we've done for the last hundred. So what you're going to see in this agenda reflects all of those areas together with our educational stakeholders, our corporate leaders, and the San Francisco family who made all of this possible. And I hope like you, like all of you who are champions of this, that each of you will be inspired by what you're going to hear today and who hopefully you're going to meet today. And of course, this would not have been possible with those sponsors who came forward, literally came forward uh, to support this uh, at, at, the, at, at, the very, um, at the very onset, including Kaiser Permanente, our lead sponsor, Hyundai, Union Bank, Visa, Starbucks, Goldman Sachs, UBS, and New York Life. So we're going to use this morning session to get inspired by some of these titans of industry. Uh, you're also going to see a very interesting lineup of, of people who are going to be talking about kind of their, their journeys, their paths, and again, hopefully see yourself in these people as we think about your own futures for those of us who, who are joining from some of the Bay Area schools. And then hopefully you'll get a chance to visit some of these exhibit halls. So in these exhibit halls, we have Pixar, Google, YouTube, and NASA who have come together to continue to provide that inspiration, that much needed inspiration for our next generation of leadership to be able to think about STEM and what it means. So thank you to all of you. And so we're gonna do this in a couple of ways. So first of all, everyone's gonna to convene together here for the morning. And then at the, uh, at the break, you have an opportunity to visit the exhibit halls. We'll come back together here. And then at the lunch break at 1230, we're gonna have two different tracks. The adults can stay in this room and we're gonna focus more on data-driven analysis, metrics, and again, deliverables as it relates to those first two pillars of writing history and, and women, money, and power. 
And then the students and their parents or whoever else wants to join them are welcome to come into Polk Hall, which is over here to your right, where we're gonna have very, very specific tracks for students in terms of civic engagement and leadership opportunities that they can learn from. And then at 4.30, we're all gonna come back here for some very cool announcements and acknowledgements. And by the way, we have a lot of swag today. I hope you had a chance to pick up your bag and your t-shirts, but in addition to that, I have a couple of other things up my sleeve. Now, you do have to be present to get it. You do. So when we conclude the day at 4.30 uh, for our final, uh, final announcements, I, I have something very, very special and very, very historic to share with you. Uh, so please, again, please stay, um, stay so, you can't, so you won't be able to, to miss the exciting announcements that we're gonna have. Now again, we do have a number of activities happening today, and Mayor Ed Lee is in the vicinity, but of course you would understand that there's a lot of, of, uh, of demands today that he has to be present for. But what he did do is he did take the time, I don't know how, but he took the time to share a video segment with us as uh, a welcome to San Francisco segment. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and show um, his video presentation. Good morning, and welcome to San it's always AV, always, it's always. We'll try that again. And again. Good morning and welcome to San Francisco. I will not be able to join everyone today, but I'm immensely proud that the city of San Francisco is co-hosting the Empowerment 2020 Count Up Conference. The conference is being led by two strong leaders, former United States Treasurer Rosie Rios and current San Francisco City Administrator Naomi Kelly. Rosie and Naomi are both proven professionals and I know they'll make great co-hosts for this event. This conference will have more than 1,000 attendees, all coming together for the advancement of women and to inspire a new generation of leaders. We're excited to hear about the experiences of our younger participants, many of whom are in attendance, representing local school districts, and are eager to join this movement. I look forward to seeing the results of this conference and riding the momentum to next year's Bay Area Women's Summit here in San Francisco. Enjoy the conference and enjoy San Francisco. Thank you so much, Mayor Ed Lee, and also, uh, as, as the mayor mentioned, a city administrator, Naomi Kelly. So for those of you who have not met Naomi, my goodness, she is a force of nature. So I'm gonna repeat a few things that I've shared with some people, so you're gonna, it's gonna be redundant, but I can't say enough about her. Naomi Kelly, as a city administrator, is the most powerful non-elected official in the city of San Francisco. She basically runs the city every day. She has almost 3,000 employees, she has almost a billion dollar budget, and she is basically making everything happen. And so what's interesting is on this particular day, where we know there's a lot of interesting activity underway, um, she made sure that she was gonna be here and saw this through. But what I will never forget is um, the way Naomi and I met was through her husband, Harlan Kelly, who is now the general manager of the Public Utilities Commission here in San Francisco, and I was a consultant for them way back when. And a few months ago, uh, they invited me uh, to dinner at, uh, at their home with their lovely sons, Trey and Mason, and, and, and Naomi's uh, mother. And the five of us are, are um, uh, six of us are having dinner together, and of course I was filling Naomi in and what I was doing and um, she didn't hesitate. She didn't hesitate to say, what can we do? What can we do? And I'll never forget getting that text from her, perhaps a week or so later, I don't remember, where she says, we wanna co-host your next Empowerment 2020 conference. And I was taken aback because I was literally at that time in my life making a decision on what career path I was gonna journey on next. And, and, and she was one of my tipping points uh, to make that decision that I, I needed to do this full time. I needed to commit myself to this effort full time. So I can honestly say uh, that without Naomi Kelly's support, 
we would not be here today by far, by far. But I also, again, I might have made some other decisions about my path forward, but she was definitely uh, one of my many angels. So um, for all of you who have not had a chance to meet her, uh, please try to do so. And you will never forget her name again, Naomi Kelly. She needs to be out front. I tell her that all the time. You need to own your power. Own your power. She is amazing. So ladies and gentlemen, City Administrator Naomi Kelly. Good morning. I am thrilled to see you all here today, especially with all the events going on. You all brave ladies and men came out here. I want you all to know we're in the safest place in San Francisco right now. <laughs> it's a privilege to be here with Rosie in the Empowerment 2020 Count Up. Um, you know, she, she's phenomenal. What she may not realize is before she came to have dinner with us, I was, uh, at the time when President Trump was announcing the educational secretary, I woke up that morning and had a very sad moment as I realized the importance of education. My mother was a teacher. I was raised by a single mother who was a teacher, so education was very important to me. And realizing the power of the sec the, that cabinet secretary to omit history, omit women's history, omit African American history, omit Latino American history, omit Chinese American history. The very backbone of this country, the economic engine of this country can be omitted from the history books. And then I look at my emails and I look at what Rosie's doing and, she, and I'm looking at her blogs and her uh, newsletters about Empowerment 2020 and teachers writing history. And it made me feel a little bit happier that there is a movement out there where Rosie is trying to get women's history in the school districts, and there were school districts who were partnering with her. And if, if, and if the school districts wouldn't partner with her, she'd get the information on the internet in this digital age. And all of a sudden, I felt a little bit better. Um, but I, said, I, I emailed her and texted her right away and said, I, I would like to support you on that. And then she came out to dinner. And so that was really the first moment where I had, or I was like, I have to support this movement. Um, you know, the, 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 the theme today is recognizing our past, connecting our stakeholders, and inspiring our future leaders. And today there's some amazing speakers who um, will take us down a journey to reinforce our theme. And in our fast-paced world where we often forget about what and who brought us to where we are now, Count Up 2020 and the 100th anniversary of the 19th, uh, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which will be in three years away. It is my hope that through this Empowerment 2020 conference in each city, more and more women will participate. We will not forget that our right to vote didn't happen overnight. The women's suffrage movement started in the 1800s. And it's important too to remember that voting rights and the struggle for women continued even after the 19th Amendment. In some southern states, African American women who had to deal not only with sexism, but also racism, did not have the opportunity to vote freely until the 1960s. We must all remember and honor and learn from the tenacity and perseverance. Uh, just here in San Francisco, we continue on the women's rights movement here, and there's been two pieces of legislation that have been passed in this last year, one by our own supervisor, Katie Tang, uh, who enacted a lactation in the workplace ordinance requiring San Francisco employers to have policies and accommodations for working mothers who want to return to the workplace and continue to uh, uh, lactate. The second piece of legislation was to close the wage gap by banning employers from consider considering past salaries and determ in determining whether to hire an applicant on what to, and, and not only in to hire the applicant, but in determining their salary. They couldn't look at past wage to uh, deter determine what to hire them at. So we're working hard to, uh, we're working hard in the women's right move movement to deal with the wage gap and the equity gap there. As Mayor Lee mentioned in his tape remarks, 
The second Barrio Women's Summit will take place next year in San Francisco on June 19, 2018 at the Moscone West Convention Facilities. I invite all of you to join us in that dialogue and discussion. And it's great because it's the Bay Area's Women's Summit. So not only is it San Francisco Mayor Lee, it is our own Mayor Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff who, will be here, who is here today, and San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo. They are co-hosting this event because they realize as a region, we are much better as a region than we are as individuals. So stay tuned for more information. As you all know, there's many events occurring here in San Francisco today that, in which the world is watching. The city leaders here in San Francisco are united against hate, believe in our First Amendment rights to free speech, but will not tolerate violence. As city administrator, I think that's worth clapping for. As city administrator, I want to assure you that you are, we are closely monitoring and ensuring a police presence citywide. I will keep close tabs on the events today throughout the city and will keep you fully informed. But as I mentioned earlier, Bill Graham Civic Auditorium is the safest place in town. So we will be good. <laughs> Thank you for your participation today and on a Saturday no less, but I promise you that it will be a time well spent. Thank you, Rosie. There's one last thing I would like to share is that earlier this summer, Rosie received an honorate uh, doctorate from Cal State University East Bay. So congratulations, Dr. Rios. And enjoy the conference. Dr. Rios. I like that. I like that. So most of you may know that I was born and raised here in, in, in the Bay Area, Hayward. Uh, <laughs> um, and so I have a lot of, of, of amazing stakeholders that I've known for years uh, who are here today, and you'll hopefully get a chance to meet some of them. Uh, but my, I, I do want to recognize just a couple of people. First of all, my mom is here. My mom. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mom, stand up. <laughs> it, it was so cute because uh, Naomi mentioned the, the, the ceremony for, for Cal City Bay. I was a commencement speaker this last uh, June. Um, I think it was, you know, 10,000 of my closest friends. I don't know. But, but uh, it was really great because I introduced my mom and, and the crowd went crazy crowd went crazy. They gave my mom a standing ovation, and there's chanting, Rosie's mom, Rosie's mom. It was very cute. It was very, very cute. Uh, and also, uh, my kids are here, Joey and Brookie. They're here. There they are. Come on. Hi. Hi. All right. <laughs> and, and my sister, Angel, is here. My sister, Angel, and my niece, Carly. Where's Carly? Where is she? She's around here. Oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> You're all grown up. My goodness. Um, and, and, and believe it or not, I mean, I have people here, uh, one of my best friends from, ready for this, 46 years ago is here, Julie and her sister Kathy, and in and, and my high school history teacher, Mr. Wilder is here, Julia from my high school, my gosh, so many people. Um, and, 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 and I can't believe how many people flew out for this. I mean, my friend Gail from Connecticut, my friend Leslie from D.C., uh, my friend Esther from Miami, um, I mean, it's just from all over uh, the country, which, um, you know, is very, very um, touching. Nellie, Nellie is here from, uh, from L.A. Uh, Mary D'Onofrio is here from, from Yale. My gosh, I mean, everyone came out of the woodwork to be here, so, so thank you. So, uh, as you know, I spent almost eight years of my career uh, as Treasurer of the United States, working to put the portrait of a woman on our Federal Reserve notes for the first time in our nation's history. And it was, um, it was a challenge. It was a challenge. But it was never supposed to be just about currency. And it was never just supposed to be about our first initiative, teachers writing history, about putting women on our walls. And it was never even supposed to be about statues. You hear about all these great statue initiatives, which I'll talk about later. It is something much more than that. It is changing how decisions are made, structural changes in how decisions are made, 
and, and, and who makes those decisions. And so, um, I, again, I, I hope you get a chance to, to, to see some of the exhibits that are here. I hope you get a chance to meet some of these amazing organizations from the Alliance for Girls that you'll see along the perimeter of this venue. The Alliance for Girls is one of the largest organizations in the country, and they're based here in the Bay Area. They represent over 100 organizations in support of girls. So if you please get a chance, please visit their tables, please walk around and get a chance to know who they are, especially the school districts. I have, again, six superintendents who are gonna be here today. Six Bay Area superintendents representing over 200,000 kids here in the Bay Area. It's, it's amazing, and, and what I'm hoping that happens today is that these conversations are just the beginning. I don't invite anyone unless I'm gonna put you to work. So there is a whole list of activities and a whole list of to-dos that's gonna happen. This is not a think tank. I wanna make that very, very clear. This is an action tank. And so for anyone, can you imagine if every think tank in DC decided to change their names to say, we are a think tank and we're an action tank. And everything that we think about, we're actually gonna do something about. Can you imagine what the world would be like if everyone who said there was a think tank said they're also an action tank? So that's what we need to do. We need to do actionable items to deliver results so people can actually see this change happen and feel this change happen, how important it is. And so that's why when you visit these exhibit areas, this third dimension that I talk about of what it means to understand why it's important is so critical. So as you visit those exhibits, you feel it, you touch it, you see it, you own it. You own it and you own your future. There is no knight in shining armor who's gonna save you in DC or anywhere else. Empowerment means finding the leader in each and every one of you to make a difference and to, <laughs> yes. I, I had the opportunity, I mean, we're in California, we are so blessed because growing up in California, my kids, you know, were born here in, in, in the Bay Area. Um, we are very lucky because not, the rest of the world isn't like this. Believe it or not, the rest of the world is not as progressive and not as inclusive as what we find here and what my kids had a chance to be raised in. When we moved to D.C., um, it's, it's a different world. It is. It's a different world. It's all about constituencies there and checking a box of what you are instead of really understanding who you are. And I had a tough time with that. I really did. You know, my, it's interesting. I mean, you, you hear all these conversations uh, about, you know, about orientation, about race, about religion. And, and, and this generation of millennials and post-millennials don't really think that way. They don't think about what day is it that they're gonna be a Democrat or Republican. They don't think about whether they're a quarter this versus half that. They don't, even orientation, it's just, it's just part of their world. They don't think about it. They think about people first. And, and, and again, this progressive and, and, and inclusive community of the Bay Area gives us that perspective. But it is up to us, it is up to us to lead on what it feels like to respect people for people. And, and you know what I love about my kids, my goodness, they're ready for this. They're half Mexican, a quarter Japanese, and a quarter Guamanian. That is the future. That is the future. And I'll never forget uh, my son's college essay. He's a, he's a rising junior at Harvard, and I'll never forget reading his, his, his Harvard essay. Uh, and he called it a tale of two grandmas. True story. I didn't even know. I had no idea. Tale of two grandmas. He wrote about his grandmother from Hokkaido, Japan, and his grandmother from Guadalajara, Jalisco. And he never once talked about their differences. He talked about how they raised them with common values, with a focus on family, on food, on faith. And he started this essay by, by saying, I am Joey. And he goes on about his two grandmothers. I call them the breakfast club. We were lucky enough to have my mom live with us uh, when, I, when I had my kids and, and my, my in-laws were coming over every day. And so, uh, so they helped with this village to raise them. So he talks about what, they, again, what they had in common and he ends it with I am Joey. He's not one or the other, he's all of it. He's all of it. And, and every day I learn from both of them. You know, Brookie has this great thing that she calls 10 seconds of courage. 
my God, I want to be her when I grow up. Ten seconds of courage for her, and it's going to be her college essays, I guess, this fall. Oh, my goodness. Ten seconds of courage for her is defined as you just need ten seconds to get over that first hump of whatever it is that you fear. Give yourself ten seconds. Just try it. And once you get past that, my God, it's amazing. So she's the one, by the way, who got me over my fear of bugs. She gave me ten seconds to pick up this one thing, and now I can do it. Now I can do it. So I always say that all the time. When I grow up, I want to be them. I learn from them every day. So today, I want you and, and, and all the, 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 the young girls who are watching these video segments, because all this will be taped and all this will be shown in the classrooms, I want, I want you to walk away with three things today. One, it's OK to be smart. Embrace your brain. Embrace your intelligence. It's OK to think about school. It's OK to think about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's another, the second one, pursue STEM. Don't be intimidated, intimidated by it. Touch it. Get to know it. Reverse engineer. Get comfortable with technology. It's important. And third, and again, by the way, you need math no matter what you do whether you want to run a nonprofit, when you want to work for the federal government, whatever you want to do, absolutely. Math, Sarah Fryer, yes, math is so important. And the final thing is, I want you to see your future. As you go around these exhibits, as you go around and meet these amazing women from Pixar, you're going to have the, you have the lead animators from, from, from uh, Cars 3 are here. And they're going to show you how to bring how to integrate art and technology to bring your characters to life. You have Google Expeditions and, and, and YouTube. Google Expeditions is your ability to create, is to watch virtual reality content. And every single person is going to get a Google Cardboard so that they can watch virtual reality on your iPhone or your smartphone anytime you want. And then we also have YouTube is going to stream the videos that, 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 that from this playlist that we created together. Amazing work. And then NASA, my gosh. Who's already seen the NASA exhibits? Oh yes, I think my kids might have broken one or two of those robots, but there's a robotics exhibit. There's a space mission exhibit. We have Dr. Yvonne Cagle, an astronaut. There she is, hi, thank you. So if anyone can tell you to reach for the stars, there she is. There she is. This is a great day indeed. And it is now my pleasure to introduce to you someone very, very special to me, who I've, I've, I, whom I've known for, for years, um, former Mayor Willie Brown. So ready for this? Mayor Willie Brown was the first person who contacted me when I, when I left the city of Oakland in 2003. He was the one who was responsible for me coming on board here in the city of San Francisco as a consultant. And he is the one whose brain I would pick all the time when I was thinking about how to win Virginia in 2008 with the Latino vote. He was the one that literally walked me through all of that. And he is the one that I asked in, uh, uh, August of 2009 to swear me in as Treasurer of the United States, but it gets better. Ready for this? He's also the one who swore me out last, last, last July, last July 2016, one of the few people other than my family who was there, both my swearing in and my swearing out ceremony, and I'm very, very indebted to him for inspiring me and empowering me to be who I am today, and, and he is a force of nature. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you, Mayor Willie Brown. Thank you, Ms. Rosie. It was 1964. I got elected to the California legislature, sworn in 120 members, 40 senators, 
80 members of the assembly, one woman. 119 people making all the rules about education, about health, about employment, about criminal justice, every aspect of the lives of people in this state. And with women making up one half of the population, only one woman participated in exercising the power of government. I was appalled. How could that be a reality. For me, I had been the fourth member of a family of five. Three ahead of me were my sisters, my mother and my grandmother. I did not know women didn't control everything. <laughs> so it was a shock to me that the legislature would be so disproportionately male. One of the things that I set about to do was to be responsive at empowering women to be a part of the decision-making process. And I must tell you, from the time that I served in the legislature to the present day, that has been a reality. And every time that I hear of a talented person, female, anywhere in the country, I always try my best to figure out how to, in one manner or another, help and assist in any way possible. So it should not have surprised any of you that when Rosie announced that she was leaving employment in the East Bay, I did exactly what every mayor should have done and would do. I grabbed her and got her over here to help us out in San Francisco. The same with Naomi Kelly, a student graduating from college. I'm now the mayor of the city, and I was instantly told about the prospective persons that could fill the role that would help me run the office. Naomi Kelly was one such person. Her career evolved, and in this city, she is the first and the only woman ever made the chief administrative officer of this city. And Rosie was incorrect. <clears throat> Rosie was incorrect when she said, one of the most powerful, every department in this city answers to Naomi Kelly, every department. <laughs> Only woman ever, and it's kind of amusing. I get the calls from department heads whom I've been associated with that are male, and they said, we're going in to see Naomi. Do you have any suggestions? I said, yes, crawl in. <laughs> this city has had the blessings of being able to empower women because it is a city that is really unusual in almost every respect. Yet, it's been San Jose, where Sam is the mayor, that has had two women mayors, and it's been Oakland, where Libby is the mayor, that has had two women mayors. This city has only had one. Dianne Feinstein is the only one this city has ever had. This city currently has a sheriff who's a woman. This city currently has a fire chief who is a woman, the longest serving in the history. This city has had a police chief that's a woman. When I say this city is unique, it is truly unique. The head of the school district, superintendent of school in this city have had one woman. I would suggest to you that years ago when we started the Women's Summit, and we did in San Francisco, and some of you participated in it, it was all for the purpose of elevating the opportunity. And when Rosie stopped signing bills, you know what she's done, dead presidents? Rosie's name 
It was on almost every one of them. And every time she did one, she'd send me one. And when she stopped doing that job, she had multiple options. Everybody wanted Rosie. She fit every mode that you could think of. But being the public servant that she's always been, she started moving around and said, what should I do? Clearly, women had not yet gotten to the point where they could occupy every position because this system discriminates against them. Clearly, there's still the opportunity and the necessity to be president of this nation for a woman. Absolute necessity. And in reality, and in reality, if this, if this system had been organized right, we wouldn't be stuck with that so-called phony electoral college. We would still be doing it by whoever gets all the votes. Whoever gets the most vote ought to win the deal in a democracy, and Hillary would be that person. Hillary would be here participating. It's yet to be done, and Rosie understood that it was yet to be done. That's why Empowerment 2020 is so extraordinarily important. And you understand that in 2020, it will be the time to say to one person holding public office in this country, you are fired. I'm looking forward to saying that to Donald Trump, and the empowerment of women will do that. Thank you and good luck. I'm re-energized all over again. And by the way, we are a 501c3, non-political, non-partisan, non-profit. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Mayor Brown. Uh, you touched me uh, in ways that um, so few of us have had the, the, the honor of, 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 uh, of, of being moved. So thank you for all that you do, all you've done and continue to do. Uh, I now get the pleasure of introducing uh, the mayor of Oakland, Libby Schaff. What I love about uh, Mayor Schaff, I call her Mayor Schaff now, but I knew her as Libby because we actually worked together in the city of Oakland. I was a director of economic development and redevelopment for the city of Oakland, and, um, and she was a legislative aide, chief of staff to Council Member Ignacio De La Fuente, and so we had a chance to work together for several years. And I've watched her all these years grow into such an amazing and dynamic leader. She's taking Oakland by the horns in ways that it absolutely needs it. And I am very, very hopeful uh, now that Oakland is in her dedicated hands. And so when I, uh, when I called her and asked her to be part of this, there was absolutely no hesitation whatsoever. And again, my goodness, so many things are, are just happened, and so she's actually here uh, when we didn't expect it to happen um, uh, for, for not just what's happening outside, but other, other issues that are happening around the Bay Area. So I really, really appreciate that she made the effort to be here this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Libby Chef. Good morning. All right, Rosie asked me to tell you a little bit about my journey to becoming the mayor of Oakland, as well as imparting a little bit of advice. So I'm gonna do those together, and I have three pieces of advice for you. And they're gonna go with hand motions so I can wake you all up, okay, you ready? First piece of advice is go long. Can you do that with me? Go long. That was good, one more time, okay? Go long. Good, that felt good, didn't it? Second piece of advice, trust your passion. Can we do that? Trust your passion. And then the last one is be uncomfortable. <laughs> you don't have to get up, but just do something that makes you uncomfortable, okay? Be uncomfortable. See, I told you I'd wake you up. All right, so let me start with the go long piece. In 1986, I dropped out of college. Uh, my parents had just gotten divorced. I was struggling with money. 
I was very um, upset. I was having some health struggles. I dropped out of college so I could work two full-time jobs to support myself. This is not an uncommon story. Go long means that sometimes you have immediate struggles and you've got to be pretty scrappy, persistent, and grind it out because in the long term, there is nothing that is going to be more valuable to you than your education, okay? Your education. I was working two waitressing jobs. Actually, I was a hostess during the day. Actually, I was a cocktail waitress during the day and a hostess at night. But I actually had to petition to get back into college. I had to scrape all my savings together and put it all up so I could get that college degree. And then I had to take out a lot of student debt, and I know a lot of people know about that, to get myself through, uh, through law school. And I gotta say, having a law degree is uh, something no one can ever take away from me. The amount of respect, especially as a woman, that you get when you are an attorney uh, it scares people a little bit. It's kind of nice. <laughs> so go long. Even when it's uh, in the short term uncomfortable and hard, invest in yourself in ways that no one can take away from you, and that is education. Trust your passion. I have always loved my city. I love my city because it stands for values. And there is no time, um, like right now, that I appreciate that. Oakland stands for inclusive diversity. It, includes, it stands for creative energy. It stands for kind of a gritty authenticity, like we, we get our hands dirty, we're workers. And it stands for progressive values. I have always loved my city. In 1995, I made a really hard decision to leave the practice of law. I had made it. I was paying off those law school loans because I was at the biggest law firm in Oakland. I made my parents proud. I didn't have lawyers in my family. In fact, my dad never quite finished college. So it was pretty cool that there was a big corporate lawyer in the family. But I walked away from that job. And I know this seminar is supposed to be about women, power, and money. But, but remember, money does not always have an even path. I took a job for half the salary. Is that crazy? That's what, that's what my parents said to me. That's crazy, Libby. I took a job for half the salary because I knew that being a lawyer was not trusting my passion. My passion was for my community. And so I took a job at a nonprofit to start a centralized volunteer program for the Oakland Public Schools at half the salary. And it is the best decision I ever made. I have never ever regretted it. And as I have trusted my passion, it has brought me to this place in my life, which is to lead my own hometown at an incredible moment. And that brings me to my third piece of advice. Be uncomfortable. <laughs> um, women, when you see a room that doesn't have a lot of women in it, women of color, when you see a room that doesn't have a lot of people in it that look like you, that are people of color, that is the very room you most need to be in. And yes, it will feel uncomfortable. Celebrate the moments when you feel uncomfortable because it means you are being bold. It means you are changing things in a way they need to be changed. So often as women, we um, kind of underestimate our greatness. Uh, I was so fortunate to do a program called Emerge California. As Rosie said, yeah, Emerge. Woohoo, Emerge! <clears throat> if any of you are thinking of running for office, Run, do not walk, run to the Emerge website and apply. It is just the most fantastic program ever. Rosie uh, mentioned that she met me when I was a council aide. I was supporting other elected officials, male elected officials, um, and helping them look great. It was doing Emerge that made me realize, you know, forehead plant, why am I not 
actually taking credit for my own good ideas, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so that is what I mean by be uncomfortable. Put yourself out there. Um, and especially my decision to run for mayor. Women tend to, when they do first run for office, and you, I don't need to tell you that we are very underrepresented in public office, in political office, but women tend to feel safer when they're a member of a group, like the legislature. And one of the things that I remembered from Emerge was, think about the executive positions. Think about the positions where you are in charge. And ladies, I've got to say, I like being in charge. <laughs> but that was uncomfortable. I actually had to give up my seat on the city council to even run for mayor. And at the time that I decided to run for mayor, in fact, up to election day, there was never a poll that showed I could win. And yet, I blew it away, right? 63% of the vote. And when my national football team, the Oakland Raiders, any Raiders fans in the audience? I know, I love them, but right now I have to call them the traitors. Um, when my football team threatened to leave my city, um, I was in some very uncomfortable rooms. If you want to be in a room with white male money, attend an NFL owners meeting. <laughs> if you look at the 100 wealthiest people in America, uh, you will find almost all NFL team owners on that list. I'm, I'm not making this up, this is just fact. Um, public official after public official has caved to the pressure of putting public money in to subsidize sports stadiums. And I will tell you, it was uncomfortable to stand up to that amount of power and tradition and say no, not in my community. We have other priorities for the public money. And everyone told me this was crazy, no elected official had done this, that I would be voted out of office, I would be recalled, I would have the Raiders Nation at my door. And, and have you seen the Raiders Nation? <laughs> Actually, I love these people. They are like the most passionate um, people in the world and they, they represent Oakland in their own quirky way really well. Um, but I did something that was uncomfortable, but that I was trusting my passion. And you know what? Even though we lost the team, and we did lose the team, I was completely surprised by how much support I got for the integrity with which we lost the team. So those are a little few stories about my journey in life. Three pieces of advice. You're gonna remember it with me, right? Go long. Let me hear it from you. Go long. Go long, trust your passion, and be uncomfortable. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Can you hear me? My mic? Excellent, fabulous. So this is gonna be fun. So joining me on stage right now as we speak is Margo Giojardis. Margo is the CEO of Mattel. So I just wanna share so everyone's aware in the audience, um, Margo is actually supposed to be in China at the moment. So the fact that she rescheduled to join us here today uh, one of the most powerful women in the world leading a global brand that really is the way we are inspiring this next generation of leadership. Think about all the amazing products that Mattel has, whether it's Hot Wheels or Barbies or American Girl. She is literally taking the lead in shaping what our children are learning, and not just what they're learning, but how they're learning it. 
And, and when, I, uh, when I first had the pleasure of meeting Margot, um, it, was, it was through some, some mutual friends, and, and Margot invited me to address their leadership group earlier this year. And I was, I was overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed, with what she has planned, what she's been doing, and, and, and what's yet to come. And so I just thought it would be a great way to really bring another dimension into this conversation about, uh, about what I'm calling this, this third dimension, right? This third dimension of what it means to be interactive and to touch and to feel and to own. And I think Mattel embodies all of that. And so uh, Margo has a, a great depth of, of, of business acumen, a very amazing career that spans uh, most recently, she was the head of Google of the Americas. Uh, and before that, she uh, was uh, with a number of other companies, including Group Groupon, uh, Discover Financial Services, where she has really been an executive in many, in many different ways. And so, you know, one of the first things that I, that I wanted to, to talk to her about, I mean, she had many, many options in front of her, but she chose to be the CEO of Mattel. And I think it's just extraordinary. So first of all, thank you so much for being here today. And, and please, you, let's Rosie. all welcome her. So taking this leap, really, from Google, head of the Americas, over to Mattel, I mean, how, how amazing is that to think about coming from a technology world to a world of, of learning? And so can you share with us a little bit, Margot, kind of a little bit what, 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 what have you already kind of thought about in terms of integrating that world, those two worlds? So, you know, I was so excited about the opportunity at Mattel for a couple of reasons. When I was at Google, my 20% project was all about child development and inspiring girls with STEM education. And when I had the opportunity to potentially lead the company, I said to myself, how awesome if I could take my 20% project and make it my 100% project. So that's really uh, what got me there and why I had to be here today. So thank you, Rosie, for putting on this amazing event. Thank you. Thank you. And can you believe it? She actually brought her daughter with her. She brought her daughter. Where is she? There she is. Thank you so much. Mari, stand up. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. And so, you know, one of, one of my... my um, my favorite phrases that I've heard you talk about is this inspiring girls through the magic of technology. So that's interesting because obviously you, you have this technology background. By the way, she, she has her, her, both her, her BA in economics and her MBA from Harvard. So she is no shrinking violet, that's for sure. But I, I want to I hear more about that. What do you think about when you think about the magic of technology for ins inspiring girls? What does that mean? Well, you know, so much of, I think, what we've all read and seen is that girls shape an image of themselves from such a young age. You and I have both talked about this a lot. By the age of six, girls are already thinking that the, the, the smartest people, the brightest people, the most innovative are men, because those are the examples that they see around them. And so it's so incredibly important that from the youngest ages, we begin to help them see, as you've done so much in your work, all the opportunities in front of them. And in addition, as we think about play, play is really purposeful. Play opens the imagination, the sense of possibility. And when you go back to the roots of it, what I find incredibly inspiring is when a child falls in love with something, they're so much more open to learning new things. And what we see is when we take, say, a, a product like Barbie. Barbie is all about imagining your possibilities, and we've been deeply focus on both Barbie having the world represented in her playroom so that every girl sees herself at mass. In addition, how do you think about every possible career? So we are in a relentless pursuit to think about all the careers where girls are underrepresented and women and ensure that girls from the youngest age, three, four, five, six, are constantly seeing those images and those play patterns, and they're getting that chance to discover what that's like. And with technology, we can make that experience even more magical. Not only can they see the story and see the product, but they can actually, through a virtual reality opportunity, imagine the career. What does it feel like to have that career every day? And I saw this unprecedented opportunity to use these play patterns that are global 
and accessible to everyone around the world, but to connect them with technology in a way that can really inspire girls. And we saw this a lot in our work at Google, our work on Made with Code, where when you brought girls into things like fashion and music and theater and other things that they tend to gravitate to in that age, and you embed coding in those experiences and you show them that art and design and creativity and music are all connected, all these fields are going to be reinvented with technology. And it's actually quite straightforward to allow them to have these experiences and all of a sudden it demystifies it. It doesn't feel scary and intimidating anymore. It feels like something I have to pursue that I'm passionate about. And so by allowing ourselves to create these platforms, to create these identities for girls earlier and earlier, to have them feel that sense of empowerment, and then to give them access to all these tools. I, mean, I, I guess I'm in a moment where I say, the world's going to be reimagined by technology. But today, 50% of our population, women and minorities, are not being included in that reinvention sufficiently. 74% of girls in middle school express interest in STEM careers, and by the time they exit high school, only 0.4% of girls is expressing an interest in computer science. Oh we have 50% less girls graduating from computer science degrees than we did 30 years ago. This is a crisis. You know, we all own a piece of this. And the science says that if we show girls those role models, if we continue to encourage them as parents and we expose them, they actually gain the confidence to pursue these careers. But we have to be part of this solution, because I won't accept that, that we are going to live in a world that's reimagined, and everyone is not going to be included. That's amazing. So, absolutely. You know, the, those statistics are startling. They are. And, 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 and we all know, you know, I, I call these areas confidence deficits. You know, there, there, there are several confidence deficits for young girls as they, as they move forward, and, and there are times where they are actually making a deliberate decision mm -hmm. whether they or not they want to pursue STEM. And so you mentioned two of them already. So, so there was a Science Magazine article that just came out this last January that identified uh, one of these confidence deficit areas, which basically said uh, that, that uh, six-year-old girls are less likely than boys to think they're really, really smart, Mm -hmm. Six-year-old girls are less likely than boys to pursue activities where you have to be really, really smart, and that the biggest changes happen between the ages of five and seven. So this isn't just something to do because, you know, we're, we're pounding our fists. There's actual harm. There's actual harm. There's a huge opportunity cost if we don't think about this Correct. differently. And especially, you mentioned, you know, the, 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 the ages of, of, of middle school and, and, and when a girl's first thinks about uh, pursuing the math and sciences, so, so critical. Um, and then it continues on in, in some other areas. And so you, you also reference that we're kind of taking a step backwards in many ways. We are. Why do you think we're taking a step backwards? That's interesting. I mean, what, what is it that, that, that somehow has changed where, where there, these, cha these decisions are being made in, in, in the opposite direction? You know, it's, it's, I don't think there's any research that pinpoints exactly why we've receded. I think just at the moment that technology has been taking off over the last 10 to 20 years, we've seen those numbers go in the wrong direction. And we know that if you want to create amazing experiences, you need that inclusive design. We saw that in spades at Google, where if the people that beta tested and developed the products didn't have an inclusive perspective, the products weren't as good, which is why companies in the Valley are obsessed about solving the diversity problem. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the most important thing to do if we want to have solutions that are truly available and relevant and useful to everyone. And so, you know, as we look forward, the evidence that I've seen is all points to the importance of seeing those role models as you talked about, parents demonstrating an important interest, not when a girl gets her first B in math, saying, it's okay, you're so good at English, that's not a problem, right? When a girl gets into the classroom, empowering her, I still remember when Mari was taking uh, accelerated science classes when she was a young girl um, in a program at Northwestern where we used to live in Chicago, and she would typically be the only girl in those classes. And I would constantly test with her, you know, if she was okay, but she didn't know the difference. She didn't notice. She was just happy to be there and explore it, and I think by encouraging her to be herself, be confident, to be bold, I think 
that is such an important piece of this. Yeah. So let's talk about this next generation. They're very, very unique. Some people refer to them as Generation Alpha. Some people refer to them as Generation Glass, basically kids who were born with an iPad in their hands and they, they see the world and, uh, through the internet and what they learned on social media, and so there's no barriers and boundaries and walls the same way that perhaps my generation might have grown up with. And, and, and you mentioned Mari, and, 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 and um, you know, she doesn't think any differently, right? So mm -hmm. let, let's talk about that. I mentioned a little bit about, about you know, millennials and post-millennials, that they see the world very differently in terms of you know, outside of these boxes. How is that translating in terms of how, how they learn and how you're thinking about product development? Absolutely. Well, we have to accept that, you know, my company is all about the intersection between digital transformation, right, and kids' development. And any educator today is confronted with the fact that 85%, as you said, of the kids two and three years old have a tablet in their hands full time. So they expect a world that's immersive and adaptable and increasingly customized. That's just not the world that they grew up in. And everything we know about how we engage people, how we help them learn and discover new things, has pivoted. And I think we have to embrace that. You know, we start that from the beginning by realizing that we really have to surround people and our kids with 360 degree experiences because that's how they experience the world. That's how they understand the world. They also see a world that's increasingly globalized and diverse. This is the first generation where 65% of this generation will be diverse. That's huge compared to where we were in previous generations. Mm -hmm. So we have to flip the model and allow kids to more deeply engage in our products to ensure that they're adaptable and immersive and react. Yet we don't want to lose the creativity. One of the things that concerns me about education, and I thought a lot this, about this in my previous life as well as this life, is that we often look at technology as a shiny object. All kids having a tablet access in schools. But that's not amazing. What's amazing is if you use technology, not to just let kids look things up or make it more efficient to grade tests or give them access to carrying their books without a giant heavy backpack. What's exciting is when you allow them to go into subjects at a more immersive level. You know, our son in Palo Alto was able to study architectural engineering in seventh grade because they could take concepts that you could only truly discover in the past in graduate school, but bring them down and allow kids to experiment with understanding the impact of seismic issues and other things and the ability to experiment and iterate and test. These things are what creates a love of lifelong learning and that sense of possibility and exploration. And that's what play, purposeful play needs to about, and that's what our education system needs to be about because Look, 65% of the jobs these kids are going to do, they don't even exist today. So people have to be much more open to a wide variety of careers and they have to be more adaptable. And purposeful play is the foundation of that. And I think our education system needs to also continue with that, that sense of discovery and possibility and imagination and experimentation. So it sounds like it's more of an experience versus, again, this kind of two-dimensional reading, writing, the thing we normally learn in classrooms and might still happen today. So, so how should, I mean, we have a, a, a large number of educators and educational stakeholders here today. I mentioned six superintendents from the Bay Area, uh, three university presidents, and, 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 and one of the, the executives from the California Community College System. So what advice would you give them in terms of what this sounds like, you know, inspired learning, inspired learning? So if you're sitting in a classroom, and certainly the way I grew up, and I think my kids' schools still do this, you know, we sit in rows, and, and we learn very specific, mm -hmm. you know, the reading, writing, arithmetic. What would you say would be more of an interesting experience for these educators as they think about their students? Well, it's interesting. Actually, um, you know, one of the heads of the Harvard um, X, which is reinventing, came and we were spending time. And he literally said that research has demonstrated that when you're sitting in a lecture, this is the moment that your brain actually flatlines. It's literally it's a moment that's the hardest to learn. And yet, if you think about so much of our learning experience, it's listening to somebody lecture us. So I do think we have to get to a moment where learning is much more engaging and adaptable. And I think some of the more forward-thinking school districts have reimagined the process where it's not about lecturing, it's about watching video, maybe before you get to the classroom. When you get into the classroom, mm -hmm. it's about discussion, discovery, experimentation, engagement, 
because that's what enables learning to go a level deeper. It's not just learning history in its road form, but it's actually understanding how that lesson of history applies to something happening yeah. today. It's showing how you make those connections and how you understand how these things come together in an integrated way. And again, these are the things that train that 21st century brain that these kids are going to need as they face a world that's moving faster than ever with the change of technology. It's more globalized. There's all these very challenging social issues. One of the reasons why today is more complex just running this event. These issues are real and they're complicated. And so people need to see those unexpected combinations and how to see nonlinear solutions. And so that only happens by asking what if and why not. It enables That's you to really thing. see those yeah. possibilities. And I, I believe if education shifted more to thinking about purposeful play needs to be forever, what is that purposeful way to take our learning experiences and constantly enable a sense of excitement and discovery yeah. and experimentation at every age? Not that we only do that when we're right. zero to five, but we need to be doing that for the rest of our lives. So what does a 21st century Hot Wheel experience look like? I'm dying to hear this. Well, you can just imagine, uh, they kind of joke at the office that I'm the lady from the future. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually okay with that because I believe that so much of the role of a leader is about seeing the future and helping people solve the problems of the future, not the problems of today. Because when you just focus on the world that it is today, things can feel incredibly hard. But when you think about where you want to be mm -hmm. and what the future is like and you move yourself there, all those barriers just don't see as important because what you're trying to do, and that's the foundation of technology. Mm -hmm. It's being willing to ask what if and why not. It's being willing to think about the next platforms that are out there. And so when I came into the office, I actually wrote a little missive to the Hot Wheels team because I felt it was one of the biggest, most unexploited opportunities. It's an amazing, you know, billion dollar brand. Yeah. And the product is beautiful, right? These little cars that have existed for decades are in a phenomenal play experience, right? They're accurate to the yeah. 164th inch and they're imaginative and inspirational. They work and they spin and they, they do all these things. But in a three dimensional world, there's the opportunity you know, at scale, we sell over half a billion of those every year. So if you could imagine if there was a chip in every one and with the cost of chipsets coming down, the experience that you could create, and we've already demonstrated actually empirically in a program with USC called Speedometry, which is now in 34,000 schools, that kids can learn math and physics at a much deeper level and it really sticks when they actually play with the cars and track to understand it. Because play, again, going back to, is so much more inspiring. So how do we actually have a 21st century experience? Well, the experience is enable kids to build endless opportunities for the different track sets, it's to put a chip in those cars. It's to enable kids to actually understand, kids their age, kids all over the world, and connect with them, and actually be able to compete and collect and collaborate and to create a community of people that all want to learn, discover, and go places in a completely different three-dimensional experience. And so the possibilities are truly endless with the technologies and the price points that are available today when everyone has access to a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Cost-effectively, the ability to connect and reimagine experiences, just like we all take for granted today, things like Uber and Airbnb and some of these other products, they're all enabled mm -hmm. by a smartphone, geolocation, and connectivity. So just think about play patterns be re being reimagined in the same way. Endless possibilities. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> that is really exciting. And you mentioned one thing earlier that I want to get into, because one of the things that I noticed when I walked into Margot's office uh, was she had this gigantic, these gigantic letters above her desk. And it said, what if? And why not? I thought, my goodness, those are two great questions. And it really is kind of this blank canvas. You literally are telling your, 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 your colleagues, your team members, that you have a blank canvas to think about what if and why not. And, and I want to ask you, what, what inspired you to come up with that? And what has happened with that? So when I think about the purpose of our company, and the first thing I did when I went there 
as I talked about, I'm the lady from the future, but the foundation of our company and our purpose is all about inspiring the wonder of childhood to create a brighter tomorrow. If we can create kids with the openness to possibilities, with that love of lifelong learning, and that skill in experimental design, which is at the foundation of innovation, if they can embrace that, we can create the leaders that can create a better society of the future. But we also needed a value structure internally that would enable us to live the way we want our kids. So we had to inspire wonder in ourselves. And the first, each letter of wonder is part of our value system. And the first one is what if and why not? Because if we want our kids to say that, we have to show up to work every day asking the same question. Because that's the only way we're going to reach far enough to create the experiences and the connectivity and the opportunities for those kids so that they can do what we want to do. And we have to reinvent ourselves too. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what, do your, what do your employees think of that? Have they, do they think this is kind of a, a, a golden ticket for them to really kind of open up their own creativity in ways they never anticipated? Absolutely. I mean, the, at the root of this, this is a creative company. And the company's gone through a lot of transformation in the last few years and trying to find its way. It's an iconic company of iconic brands that are beloved around the world across multiple generations. But it is an industry in disruption. Kids are changing. The retail channel is changing. There are so many forces at work, and we have to see that future if we're going to stay relevant. And it's one of the reasons I went to the company, because I feel there's so many iconic companies that have been beloved, but if they are not reinvented for the future, they're not going to be as exciting five or 10 years from now as they are today. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge. And so I really wanted our employees to dig deep, find that inner creativity. This company was started in a garage, just mm -hmm. like Google. It was started by two founders that passionately believed in creating a different type of toy experience. Many people might not know that Barbie was started because it was, it was actually named after the founder's daughter. And it was all about showing her that why should girls just play with baby dolls and paper dolls? Girls should be able to imagine themselves as adults, to be able to be empowered. And in that age, she was Malibu Barbie. She was from the West Coast. She was independent, she had her own house and her own car, and she was gonna make it happen. And you can imagine in the 40s and the 50s, that was like really <laughs> out there. It was, it was, and she was fashionable, and you know, she was forward, and that was the whole ethos of the company, it was that sense of what it was, and the, Hot Wheels is the same. Those are the two foundation products of the company. It was all about an accessible product that every child could play with, that every child could connect with instantly. Yeah. But even for parents, I gotta tell you, when I walked into that headquarters, I was taken aback. It was, it was, it was you know, so much nostalgia, but it was also kind of, it was very hopeful for me because again, it, it, it is, it is a, an iconic brand. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but you do see the possibilities. You do see where this could go. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so as we think about, for example, 2020, 2020 is three years from now, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. I mean, three years isn't a lot of time, but, but three years when you integrate technology, it's kind of compounded. And so I know you can't give away any trade secrets, but I'm dying to know, I mean, what do we think is going to happen in three years? It's kind of interesting. Well, you know, it's, for us, it's so empowering. When we ask those questions, what if, why not? When we look at the connectivity with technology and how that can help us reimagine our products, but also take our existing products and put the consumer at the center and reimagine them as systems, not items. We need to move from items to consumers. From product lines, we need to think about these as experiences. And we need to move from transactions to relationships. When you think about the world that way, all of a sudden, you approach everything you do in the company. So you know, we aspire to be the global leader in learning and development through play. And I think the foundation of that is taking our existing play experiences and anchoring them even more rigorously. We have four PhDs on staff. We have seven decades of learning and development experience. And we have now created a pri proprietary learning and development framework around which we're anchoring every single one of our brands and the development of those products against the 21st century skills kids need to succeed. So in three years, I want to see every one of our product lines deeply purposely based, but abjectly fun. Because when kids love something, they're willing to stay with it and explore it. And we have to then embed in those beloved play patterns, magical, 
development that's going to enable them to be successful. And I want us to have the best possible set of solutions for kids and parents that covers every skill that kids need to succeed. That's amazing. That is really extraordinary. It, it, it's like right out of, can you imagine being a kid, can you imagine, Mari, can you imagine, I, I had a chance to, to meet your brother at the retreat, but can you imagine like her kids getting to, to walk into Mattel and that's my mom? It's like straight out of Big, like straight out of the movie Big. It's crazy. Well, you so, have to be slightly crazy. You, <laughs> this is the only company in the world where you sit in the senior team meeting and you talk about pooperoos with a straight face, right? <laughs> So, so, so obviously, you know, we, we, we had a Barbie. I think we had one Barbie growing up, you know, amongst the six girls. But I'm, I'm curious, like, when you were a kid, did you ever, I mean, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you ever think, my gosh, I mean, you're going to be the CEO of this very major global brand. What did you want to be when you grew up? So nobody who knew me as a kid would have ever known that I was going <laughs> to do this. <laughs> I was always a little bit of a crazy kid. But actually, I started out thinking I was going to be a musician. Um, and then I ended up evolving to thinking I was going to be an economist in the third world. So I ran around um, working in Asia. And all of this kind of makes sense at some point. When you look back on it, I was kind of a data geek uh, before my time. And I eventually morphed you know, into really solving problems with data, being really relentlessly focused on consumers, focused on data, focused on building ecosystems. Yeah in different kinds of ways, in different kinds of industries, which ultimately led me to Google. And then I always believe you know, in following your passions. And my, my passion, I think this passion for finding a way to be, do well by doing good is at the root of it. That was the ethos of Google and what really attracted me mm -hmm. to that company. And I saw in this iconic brand this opportunity to do something amazing for kids and families as well as to build a vibrant and a successful business in parallel. And I think that's really what the future is about, mm -hmm. is connecting those mm -hmm. two things together. Because I think that's what gives people meaning at work, and it's what also ensures that the consumer base that you're working with understands who you are and why you exist mm -hmm. and why it matters. And what was that, that instrument that you wanted to be a musician with? Violin and viola, yeah. There it is. Isn't that amazing? But I, that's an interesting path because obviously you exercise your right brain and your left brain along your entire journey. I mean, I think you also were a partner at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. so, so it's interesting, this, this path of, of integrating technology, the business angle, now what you're doing now in terms of this development angle is, is, is definitely, I think, a, a good lesson for everyone in terms of exercising that right and left brain perspective. And well, I really believe in talking about STEAM, not just STEM. Science, technology, engineering, arts, and yes. math. Yes. And I think that's been the big pivot in technology. You know, Apple really started it by having truly simple and beautiful experiences. And I think people were inspired by how much that would drive penetration of their products. You know, at Google, that was something we had brilliant technology, but we had to step up on the experience. And I think the companies solutions became magically more impactful the more they focused deeply on user experience. And so things need to be beautiful and technically awesome. And I think that's the same as I approach you know, our, our products at Mattel. If they're not incredibly fun, easy, and accessible, and that's how we take that seven decades of learning development, we're able to take things to the right level for the right child at the right time mm -hmm and ensure that they can truly do those things and we don't intimidate them. I think too much of the products that are available today that are more STEM-based, either they're not fun and kids don't like eating spinach, mm. for the most part, mine do actually, but <laughs> <laughs> most kids don't like eating spinach and we've got to make it fun and yeah. when they fall in love and they discover, that's what drives their passion. Yeah. It's amazing. And so we talked about educators, we talked about obviously we're here to inspire the next generation of girls. But, but what, as, as, as fathers, as brothers, what should we be thinking about in terms of how do we encourage this? What, what, is, what, is, what is our role? What is their role? Well, it's incredibly important, I think, both. I think the world is flat. You know, I've, I have two sons as well as a daughter, and I'm really proud of the fact that I believe that our sons have grown up in an environment where they see the world as flat. My husband also has a very successful career, and they see two parents that are equals. And... That's, I think, an important message. But as we bring men along, I think you and I share the same you know, view, which is we want to talk about equal opportunity empowerment 
not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the important thing to do so that our society is a better place. And I truly believe when everyone is included, the solutions are better, our ability to embrace that future of change is so deeply important. So men have to be part of that equation. And so for me, as we think about our play patterns, we're really trying to drive that integration. But we're also thinking about dads. Dads in millennial age are never more involved in their kids. And I'm so excited, as I've gotten deeply involved in this company, how much dads have changed. And in fact, I was speaking at a conference, a technology conference, a couple months ago. And what gave me joy is I was at a dinner. And there were a lot of guys there, because technology still has work to do. Um, but we were all sitting at the dinner table, and what was fascinating to me is every single one of those dads, all they wanted to know was how they could help their kids, and in fact, their daughters in particular, mm. get excited about technology. So I feel like the message is getting out, and dads are stepping up and realizing what their role is. Uh, we even put an, an ad on the Super Bowl about dads playing with their Barbie with their daughters. Mm. And, any man who really wants to understand their daughter, get on the floor with her and play Barbie and you will understand in 20 minutes <laughs> how she sees herself, her family, her sense of possibility and the world around her because that's what she really sees. Mm -hmm. And I think we can never get away from those simple direct mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. between two human beings. That's amazing. Well, I, I, I think you, you touched on a thing that is near and dear to my heart, which is it's an equity issue. Mm -hmm. and, and it's no longer just this, you know, the, this issue about that's a, that's a girl thing or that's a woman's thing. It's a human thing. And, and, and we all have skin in the game. This is half the population. This is half the population. And everyone has a daughter, a niece, a granddaughter, a sister, a mother, et cetera who hopefully has these same experiences. And, and, and so we all know if it's half the population, whether you're green, purple, or red, if, if, if they lose, we all lose. Right. And, and that's exactly what I'm, I'm certainly finding out. You know, a lot of my champions have been men with daughters. Absolutely. They've been men with daughters. And, and I'll never forget, you know, Secretary Tim Geithner, who was my, my first boss in Treasury, uh, never hesitated. Never hesitated. I was very careful about what I brought to him, and I was very strategic and deliberate about what I brought to him. Uh, but I know that, that, um, that he saw in his own daughter at the time the, 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 the possibilities uh, and, and the world that we had to create in order to allow them to fly, to empower them, to be who they wanted to be. Absolutely. And so to all those young girls, I'm going to end on this question, this last question. To all those young girls who are here and who are going to be watching these video segments, what would you tell them? What do you wish someone told you at that lovely age of 11 or 12 years old that, that, that you would tell them now? You know, I, th I think about this a lot. Um, and I think the most important thing I ever was told, which I truly believe and I pass it on to everyone, is that my father from a young age always pushed me to follow people and passions. And it was a very simple concept but I've followed it throughout my life and it has been so incredibly empowering. And it's not just people, but it's people that you see as really pushing the boundaries. People that take you to places and see the world in ways that you wouldn't have seen it before. And if you do that in things that you're passionate about, it never serves you wrong because you open up your mind to more possibilities. You expand the concentric circles around you and you are always at your best when you care about something. And I think if you think about that always, I think it will take you to amazing places. It certainly has for me. That's amazing. Well, I can't tell you, this has been quite an incredible discussion. I think there are a lot of takeaways from this session. And I just want to reiterate one more time how grateful we are that you changed everything around to, bring, to be here this morning, to bring Mari and to be part of this discussion, and that this is just the beginning of much more to come for you and for Mattel. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rosie. Really appreciate it.